Thank you for joining us today for this life-changing message from River of Life. If you are ever in our area, we would love for you to join us. For more information, visit us at rolcrawfordville.com. That's rolcrawfordville.com. Or download our app in the App Store under ROL Crawfordville. Now, let's join Derek Gray as he teaches from the Word of God. Our scripture tonight, uh, Romans 16, uh, 25 to 27. This is the very last three verses of this of Paul's letter to the Romans. And so we have appropriately titled tonight's lesson, The End. Let's read our verses. This is Paul writing. He says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages but has now been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. So Paul ends his letter to the Romans with what we call a doxology, and you may have heard that word before. The word doxology comes from two Greek words, the Greek word doxa, which means glory, and the word logos, which means word. So a doxology is literally a glory word or a word of glory. Uh, basically, a doxology is a statement um, or, or several statements that basically draw attention to or ascribe glory to God. Now, you'll find several doxologies in the New Testament. Um, one of the most well-known ones is found in the book of Jude. Jude, of course, was the Lord's actual brother. And uh, he, has, he wrote probably at the end of his letter, uh, probably the most famous doxology. Let me read this to you. This is in Jude 1, 24 to 25 says this, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. That's a, that's a good doxology right there. But a doxology is not restricted to the Bible. Anybody can write a doxology. You can go home tonight and take out a pen and paper and write your own uh, doxology. In fact, one of the most famous doxology uh, was written in the late 1600s by a man by the name of Thomas Ken. And uh, we've been singing this doxology now for 300 plus years. It goes like this, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. If you grew up in any of the mainline denominational uh, uh, Protestant denominations, you sang that Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. That's 300 years old. So anybody can write a, a, a doxology. And the purpose of the doxology is really always the same. It's just to draw attention to the glory of God. And that's what Paul is doing. And it is absolutely fitting, I think, that at the end of Romans, as you come to the very end of the letter, Paul is no longer teaching, he's no longer commanding or exhorting or explaining or defending or any of those things. He is just simply worshiping. The last thing he's going to do before he leaves this letter is just end with a doxology. And the last phrase of his, of his letter, to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. So for our final lesson, we're going to do exactly the same. We're going to finish our journey through Romans, uh, focusing on the glory of God, and hopefully we'll learn something. Now, I want to start tonight by trying to define what is the glory of God. If you've been in church for any amount of time, you might just hear somebody shout, glory to God, <laughs> right? Or you hear people talk about, to God be the glory. What does that mean, really? What, what, what is the glory of God? Well, it turns out it's not that easy to define. In fact, glory is more like the word beauty than it is the word basketball. Let me explain what I mean by that. If you ask me to define the word basketball, 
I could do that pretty easily. I would say, I would say something like, well, it's, it's round, uh, it's inflated with air, uh, the circumference is 29 and a half inches, it can be made out of rubber or leather so that it bounces and it's used in a game where the object of the game is to put it through a hoop, right? So I just explained the word basketball. I gave you details for that. But it, what about the word beauty? How do you explain or define the word beauty? It's not very easy. In fact, if I gave you a piece of paper and said, take the next 10 minutes and try to define beauty, my guess is nobody would have a definition by the end of 10 minutes. It's just, it's a word that's not easy to define. Now, we know what it is, don't we? Everybody knows what beauty is, but you know it because you've seen it. You know it because you've experienced, not because you can put some kind of, some kind of detail on it. Well, glory is like that. The glory of God, it's more like the word beauty. It's just not easy to define, but we're going to try. And I think the easiest way to understand glory is to compare or to contrast it with the holiness of God. So that's where we're going to start. Now, when we say that God is holy, everybody here, if, you're been, if you've been in this Roman study for any amount of time, you should know what the word holy means. The word holy means set apart. That's what it means. So when we say that God is holy, we literally mean He is set apart. In other words, He is apart from all, any other thing, any other being, any other person. He is completely in a class, if you will, all by Himself. He is incomparable. He is undefinable. He is unmatchable. He's in a class of greatness and perfection and beauty and all of that all by Himself. In fact, Every characteristic of God is in a class by Himself. His love is unlike anybody else's love. His faithfulness is unlike any other's faithfulness. His truthfulness is like anybody. It's just in a class all by Himself. He is holy. Now listen to what the angels say about Him. In Isaiah chapter 6, if you go back and read it, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And when he saw the Lord, the angels were around the throne. And this is what they're saying. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now, I want you to think, stop right there for a moment. It, I mean, this is just astounds me. They're sitting there around God and they're, it's almost like they can't come up with the words. How do you describe what's undescribable? It's almost like they're saying it's just... Set apart, set apart, set apart. There's nobody like you. You're in a class. You don't, are you with me? It's like the English language or whatever language they have just doesn't have the words to describe God. And so all they say is holy, holy, holy. But now watch what they said next. The whole earth is full of his, not his holiness. He's holy. But the whole earth is full of His glory. The Bible tells us elsewhere, I think Psalm 19 says, the, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. You see, God's glory is the display of His holiness. Let me say that again. His glory is the display of His holiness. When you and, and I, and I've said this numerous times, when we walk outside and we look up at the constellations, and we look up at all of that, that's displaying the holiness of God, the glory of God. We should look up and think, what kind of God is this? There's nobody like this. When you look at your body, and you look at the, the way uh, the, the psalmist said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. When we look at ourselves, and just the other day I was watching a, a video, I was telling Ron about this this morning, and I don't know why I was watching it on, uh, we had tried, Kathy had grown some zucchini. And uh, the plant did really good, but the fruit didn't do very good. So I was watching this, uh, this video about growing zucchini. And it turns out that zucchinis have male flowers and female flowers. And the, the male flower has to pollinate or basically inseminate the female flower. And the female flower actually has ovaries inside of it. I mean, you're sit I'm sitting there watching a video on a zucchini plant, and I'm saying, what kind of God is this? Well, that's the glory of God right there in a, in a plant. 
You, if you just will open your eyes and see it, the whole earth is, is the display of His holiness, how unique He is, how incomparable He is, how unmatchable and undefinable He is. Another way to say it is that His glory is the revelation of His holiness. Look at Leviticus 10.3. God says this, I will be shown to be holy, I will be glorified. So when something shows how unique God is and how wonderful God is and how just set apart God is, that is that's showing His glory. That is glorifying Him. It is a display of His holiness. In Exodus 33... Moses got to ask God something that, as far as I'm aware, nobody else has ever got to do. And Moses asked God this. He said, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And what, I think what Moses is saying to God is, show me, show me who you really are. Show me your holiness. Show me what makes you God. And this is God's answer in Exodus 33, 19. He said this. Okay, I'll make all my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim or remind you of my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So Moses says, show me your glory. And God says, okay, Moses, I'm going to do three things for you to show you my glory. The first thing I'm going to do is I'll make my goodness pass before you. Number two, I'm going to proclaim my name to you, which is Yahweh or the Lord, or I'm going to remind you of what my name is. And then number three, he says, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. Now, the first one we would kind of expect, right? If, it, it, you know, you, it, you're taught, you know, God, uh, you know, sometimes Moses and they heard him out of the whirlwind. They heard him out of the smoke. They heard him out of the fire. And, he, and he's like, show me your glory. And so in some way, God says, okay, I'm going to show you physically who I am. Now, God doesn't have a physical body. The Bible tells us that God is spirit, and they that worship Him must, must worship Him in spirit. But in some way, He showed Moses physically who He was. And whether it was just a bright light or what it was, we don't know. You can read this in Exodus 33, 20 to 23. And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me, where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by. Remember, the, the, it's, the, it's the display of my holiness. While my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I've passed by. And then I'm going to take away my hand, and you can see my back, but you cannot see my face, for no one sees my face and lives. So in some way, he shows himself physically to Moses. And then he says the second thing, he says, I will proclaim my name or, or he's going to remind Moses of his name because he's already told Moses back in chapter 3 what his name was. In Exodus chapter 3, 13 through 14, God has come to Moses. He said, I want you to go back to Egypt and I want you to uh, tell my people that uh, I'm going to rescue them. I'm going to get them out of slavery and we're going to defeat Pharaoh and all that. And Moses said this. If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? What should I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, we read that and we don't think much of it sometimes, but I did a little Google search. Remember, Moses is about to lead the people out of Israel. They're going to cross the Red Sea. They're going to go out into the desert. They're going to be there for 40 years, and then they're going to go into the land of Canaan. So I just did a little Google search of what were the Canaanite gods. They were going to go into this land of Canaan, and this, Can this land has all these false gods. What were their names? So this is a list. This is not all of them, but this is a list of some of the Canaanite gods at that time. You had Anat, who was the goddess of war. You had Dagon, who was the god of crop fertility. You had... Uh, Kathirat, who's the goddess of marriage. Kothar, the goddess of, god of craftsmanship. Molech, the god of fire. Uh, Mot, the god of death. Resheth, the god of plague. Shapash, goddess of the sun. Yurik, god of the moon. And then here's God, and he says, what's your name? And he just says, I am who I am. You don't, you don't put me in a box. You don't make me just the god of the sun. Or just the God of death or the God of fertility. You don't even make me the God of the universe. 
I'm way more than that. I just am who I am. You want to know who I am? I'm just, I am who I am. You don't define me like you define your little uh, images that sit on the mantle. I am who I am. God's name is a reflection of His being. He is the only self-existent, self-sufficient being in the universe. We don't put, we don't, you, you can't name Him like that. He just said, I am who I am. Then God makes one final statement to Moses, which almost, let's be honest, seems out of place. He says, show me your glory. And God says, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. Why would God say that? Well, what God is saying, he's saying, Moses, what makes me God is that I decide and I act freely. I act according to the purposes of my will. Nobody makes me do anything. Now, just think about that for a moment. Everything God does, it's not caused or controlled or constrained by anything outside of himself. He does it according to his own will. That's what it means to be God. You go back and look at those Canaanite gods. They would sacrifice their children to Molech so that he would somehow give them a good crop. Or, or, or God says, you don't make me do anything. I do it because I want to do it. That's what makes me God. Now, that is the glory of God. It is the display of His holiness. But what most of us miss is the effect that the glory of God has on us from the time we're born until the time that we die. And in fact, even beyond that. So what we're going to do tonight with a little bit of time we got left is we're going to go back to the beginning of Romans. All the way back to chapter 1. And we're going to walk through it all the way. And whether we've realized it or not, Paul has left a little trail of breadcrumbs all throughout the book where he's talked about the glory of God and the glory of God and the glory of God and the glory of God. And what we're going to see as we walk through this book is we're going to see how the glory of God should affect us. And I think that's what Paul wants us to see and what he wants us to savor. So we start here. The glory of God is our purpose. The glory of God is our purpose. Romans 1.5 Paul says, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. Say it with me. For the sake of His name. Listen to me. We start here, even though Paul doesn't use the word glory, because the thought is the same. This is what we were made for. This is our purpose. For the sake of His name. To, to live lives so that Christ can be seen in our life as infinitely glorious. As more valuable than any other person or any other thing or any other possession or any other idea. That's what we were created for. To reflect the glory of God. That's our reason for being. Our, our lives... What, what does Jesus say? Do your good work so that men can see you and do what? Give glory to God. Uh, I think uh, Blackie up here talked about this on Sunday. That's what our good works do. They, they, when we are doing things and exhibiting His character, His love, His faithfulness, His, His forgiveness, His mercy, His, all of these things, we are reflecting the holiness of God. And people should look at us and be able to see Him. That's what we're made for. That's what we're created for. But the glory of God is also our failure. Romans 1.21, For although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor give thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. The fact is, as human beings, we are created to display the glory of God. And every single one of us comes into this world, and we fail to do the thing that we're created for. In fact, what have we done? Paul goes on in Romans 1.23. We have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. We, are, we, we come into this world as human beings and we are made, created, purposed to bring glory to God. And we say, no, I don't want anything to do with you. I'm going to set up these images. By the way, the image may be something that sits on a mantle. It may be something that hangs from your rear view or it may be the image you see in the mirror. But we all worship something other 
than the God of this universe. That is our failure. The glory of God is also our judgment. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the human condition. We've all, the thing that we are supposed to treasure and love and live for, we've put it away. We've exchanged it. We literally lack the glory of God in our life. And by the way, folks, that is the very essence of sin. We are created to love and treasure the glory of God, and yet we all come into this world and none of us do that, which means we have committed an outrageous crime against God. And this statement may shock you, but that crime is far more serious than murder or rape or theft or lying or any other thing we can do against another person. Therefore, we stand under the wrath of a holy God and we need a Savior. And thank God, the glory of God is also our rescue. Romans 4.20 Talking about Abraham, Paul says this, No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Do you know that one reason that faith is the way God chooses to save us is faith is inextricably linked with the glory of God. Faith is inextricably linked with the glory of God. Let me give you an example. In Luke 18, Jesus tells a parable. Very well-known parable, we've all heard it, about two men who go into the temple to pray. And one man is a Pharisee. He's a religious man. Okay? The other man is a tax collector. Now, tax collectors in that day were traitors. They were a traitor to their race. They were a traitor to their people. They were a traitor to their country. They were the dregs of society. So here you got one guy who society looks at and says, man, this guy's got it all together. He's a Pharisee. And over here, this guy is the lowest of the low. And Jesus said these two men go into the temple to pray. And the Pharisee, the religious man, standing by himself, said this, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like that tax collector over there. Thank you that I'm not like him. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. And Jesus said this, the tax collector standing afar off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, that man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. You see, what faith does is it puts us in a position of being weak. It puts us in a position of being dependent. And it puts God in the position of being strong and mighty, and a Savior, and merciful, and forgiving. Paul said in Ephesians, we are saved by grace, not by works so that any man could boast. That's why God did it, because He is going to get the glory. If it's because you're a good person, or you're smarter than other people, or you did good works, then you're going to go up and God goes down. But faith says you're nothing. I saw, you're nothing. You can't earn it. So faith is essential to displaying the glory of God. The glory of God is also our hope. Romans 5, 1 and 2, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we've also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I want you to see what Paul's saying here, because this is beautiful. We're justified now. We're saved. I've been forgiven. I have peace with God. That is an incredible, incredible thing. But here's the thing. In this life, we got to go through hard times. In this life, you're going to have suffering. In this life, there's going to be trials, emotional and physical and relational. And without the hope of something on the other side... Paul said, if, there, if there's nothing on the other side after death, then we are of all people to be most pitied. If there's nothing on the other side, then Paul said, just go eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow you're going to die. We're all the same. But here, Paul says, we hope in the glory of God. And what do we hope for? Listen to me, and I, and I hope I can get this point across. I hear people talk, listen, I, we're going to live forever. That's wonderful. 
We're going to be raised from the dead. That's great. We're going to live, by the way, on this earth forever. You know that, right? God's going to recreate this earth and make it a habitation suitable for us. We're not going to sit on the clouds somewhere. We're going to live right here. God will come down and be with us and be our God right here on this earth. It's going to be incredible. But that's not what makes heaven heaven. What makes heaven heaven is this. There's a longing in each one, every one of us as deep as it can get. If you can go down and find it, there is a longing for all the ugliness to be made beautiful. There's a longing for all the bad to be made good, for all the injustice to be made right. To, to, for, to see the greatest beauty and the greatest power and the greatest justice and the greatest mercy. In other words, the longing of our heart is not just to live forever. The longing of our heart is to see Him as He really is. That's heaven. That we, we not today, we see through a glass or through a mirror darkly or through a glass darkly. But on then, we will see Him as He is. We will see His holiness. And let me tell you, Paul says that hope of the glory of God, the hope of seeing Him in His glory, is going to make all the sufferings that we experience in this life worth it. Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. In other words, his, who He really is is going to be opened up and revealed to us. And it is going to be mind-blowing. The glory of God is going to be, just in and of itself, is going to be so overwhelmingly satisfying that anything you went through on this earth, it, you tragically lost a family member, or you experienced a long illness, or even a painful death, let me tell you, all of that will be as nothing. As nothing. When you see Him as He is. That's what Paul is saying. That's our hope. The glory of God... But not only that, it doesn't stop there. It gets even better. The glory of God is our glory. Romans 8, 21. Paul says the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of not God, but who? The children of God. That's our glory. See, the fact is we will be made glorious at the resurrection. We will receive a new body. The creation itself, this earth, will be made a suitable habitation for us. It is so certain that Paul speaks of it as already being done. Romans 8.30, And those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he doesn't say he will glorify. It's already done. It's just a matter of time. It's already done. Now think about that for, for a moment. Not only will we see Him as He is, will we see His glory, but that longing that you always had, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, I'm telling you there are days you get up and just think, what is wrong with me? Why, what's wrong with me? On that day, there won't be anything wrong with you anymore. And on that day, your mind and your body and your spirit and your heart and everything about you will be an uncontaminated reflector of the glory of God. Uncontaminated. It is going to be amazing. Until then, the glory of God is our answer. If you were with me when, back when we went through Romans 9, most of you know that we're here. Romans 9 is a tough chapter. It's a tough chapter. It's full of some really, really deep theology. It's not easy to get through. But Paul made this statement in Romans 9. He said this, What if God, desiring to show His wrath and to make known His power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of His glory for vessels of mercy, which He has prepared beforehand, for glory. Right there, Paul answers one of the greatest questions that mankind has. And that is, why does God allow a world with so much suffering? Why does He allow a world with so much sin and so much death and so much suffering and so much destruction? Paul just answered that question. His answer was this, that the evil 
serves a purpose. And its purpose is to display the glory of God. In other words, what Paul just said is that God's judgment of evil on some and God's rescue from evil of others displays His glory more fully than if there had been no evil at all. That's his answer. That's exactly what he just said. Now let me tell you, that is an incredible, astounding statement. I mean, it's, it's mind-blowing. Do I understand it? No. No, I hear what he says. I just, I don't get it. But what he's telling us is the highest and deepest and most ultimate answer as to why the world is the way it is, is that in his wisdom, the world the way it is, is going to reveal his glory to the fullest. And that's what we have to rest in. Paul says we walk by faith, not by sight. So he just answered that question for us. Because one day we'll see, oh, oh, <laughs> this is why you did it. Until then, the glory of God is our doxology. Romans eleven thirty six, one of the greatest statements in the Bible, for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Paul says God is the ultimate origin, He's the ultimate sustaining power, and He's the ultimate goal of all things. Your suffering that you're going through, your sickness that you're going through, the relational pain that you're going through, it's from Him, it's through Him, it's to Him. All things work for good to those that love Christ. All of it is working to bring Him glory. Stand on that. Hold on to that. Wrap your arms around that. Until then, the glory of God is our declaration. Romans 15, 5 through 6. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, this is why Jesus bought His church, and this is why Jesus builds His church. Not so that you can stay at home and, and worship in isolation, so that we can gather together different races and different cultures and, and different backgrounds and different baggage. And we can come together like a united choir and lift our voices and glorify our Father who is in heaven. That is the purpose of the church. That's what we're here for. The glory of God is our motivation. Romans 15, 7. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Why, Paul? For the glory of God. Welcome one another just as Christ has welcomed you. Why did Christ accept me? Why did Christ show mercy to me? He did it for the glory of God. And he says, now you do that for one another. You do that for one another. Welcome one another. Not because uh, it's a good work you're going to get uh, paid for back one day. No, do it for the glory of God. We are to welcome one another as family. It's not about us. In the end, it's all about him. One final thing. Verse 25, and I, don't want, I didn't want to close before I looked at this one thing. Paul said this, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to think about that for one moment. Of all the things Paul could have said, now to him. Do you remember uh, when we started the lesson, we read, we read Jude? What did Jude say? Now to him who is able to keep you and present you blameless. Y'all remember that? That's what Jude said. Paul could have, I mean, he had all these different acts and abilities of God. He could have picked anything to say. But he said this, Now to him who is able to strengthen you through the gospel. What does he mean by that? Well, what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins, rose again, and all things are now under his feet, including death. And the fact is that I am no, there is, I have no condemnation. I am, I am, I am living a life of, I mean, I'm going into heaven. I've got everlasting joy if I will just put my faith and trust in him. That is our strength. Because you are going to hurt in this life. You are going to go through suffering in this life. You are going to experience tragedy and pain in our life. 
And in all the tribulations and all the trials and the sicknesses and the failures of our marriages and our, all these other things, anything the world can throw, up, throw at us, the gospel is my strength. Why? Because I'm standing here with all this stuff coming at me and I know that He died for me and He loves me and He saved me and He forgave me and He's going to prepare a place for me and He's coming back for me. Paul put it this way in Romans 8, 831. What do we say to these things? Say it with me. If God be for us, who can be against us? If God did all that for me, then these other things, I mean, come on. You see, you never outgrow the gospel. I, I see people that come into church and we think sometimes that we got saved by the gospel, but then you get up and you just go walk through life and you're, you know, you, you got all these other things, but you leave the gospel behind. But that's not what Paul says. Remember, he's writing to an obedient church. If you go back and you read all the names, some of these people have been Christians for 20, 25 years. This is a good, strong, mature, motivated church. And Paul ends and says, Now unto him who strengthens you through the gospel. You see, you don't begin the Christian life with the gospel and leave it behind. God strengthens us with the gospel every single day. In fact, the older I get and the more I know, the more I realize I need a Savior. The more I know about the Bible, the more mature I get in Christianity, the more I understand, thank you for the gospel. Because I can't do it. I cannot do it. I know I can't do it. I am sure I can't do it. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you for choosing me. That's how you strengthen yourself through the gospel. Which brings us all the way back to where we began uh, to verse, our verses today. Romans 16, 27. Paul ends this, to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. That is the cry of Paul's heart. Is it the cry of your heart? Is it the cry of our heart? Because listen to me, that's what we're made for. If you will live a life and do your best every day, your purpose for that day is to glorify God in some way. You are fulfilling your purpose. And I'll tell you right now, that is the most satisfying, fulfilling life you will ever lead because you're doing what you were created for. Step away from that and live a life that doesn't glorify God, then I don't care how much money, how many toys, how, you can fill that life up with everything and it's empty. It's completely empty because you're not doing what you were created for. That brings us to the end of the great book of Romans. Let me say before I close in prayer, I want to say thank you. We started this uh, study in August of 2020. And uh, so 22 months later, I get the, I am one of the most blessed people in the world because I get to do every Wednesday night what I am absolutely passionate about. I love doing it. How many people get to get up every week and know I get to do what I absolutely love to do? Not that many. But it would not be the same if nobody showed up. <laughs> I mean, it just wouldn't be the same. I'm sure Henry would come and sit there and I could, I could you know, go back and forth with him. But I just want to say thank you uh, for um, coming out and, and being faithful. As I look around every Wednesday night, I can, I know, like I said, y'all all sit in the same place. So I know, I, I know when you're here. Um, so I appreciate that. Real quickly, what's next? Um, I, I believe uh, several months ago, I want to say back in November, I called pastor one day and I said, I got an idea that I want to do something. And we talked about it, and, and we kind of dropped it. And then I went on, and, and anyway, it, it, it just never would leave me that I've something I've wanted to do. I want to do a series of lessons on relevant cultural topics. Relevant cult. I, we, I don't know about y'all, but this world is gone mad. It's gone mad. And, and, and there are things that are facing us and facing our children that, honestly, I never thought we'd even have to talk about. I didn't think we'd ever have to talk about them. It was just obvious. Why would you talk about those things? But the fact is, we need to talk about them. Right now, I've got five things on my agenda. Um, I want to talk about abortion. 
What does, and, and folks, listen to me. It, it is not about what I believe. It don't matter what I believe. What matters is what does the Word of God say. That's what matters. That's, it doesn't, you, there's so many competing voices out there. And, and by the way, they'll say they're all Christian. This one's a Christian, and that one's a Christian, and that one's a Christian, and they're on the opposite ends. Who do you believe? What do you hear? How do you... It, no, set that aside for just a moment, and let's go to the Word of God. And let's see what the Word of God says about abortion. Same thing with race. We're, we're dealing with critical race theory. We're, we're dealing with, with racial issues. What does the Bible say about it? Gender, again, I thought we'd never have to have this discussion. But all of a sudden, what has been just standard truth for thousands of years is all of a sudden going out the window. What does the Bible say? And then, of course, homosexuality we need to deal with. Is I'm also open to some others. Right now, these are the five. By the way, we will start where you have to start. And that is... Is there such a thing as truth? And the second question is, is the Word of God the truth? Because let me just tell you, if you don't believe it is, then don't come. Because I got nothing for you. Honestly, if you don't believe the Word of God is the truth. Now, I'm going to prove it to you. We're going to take a look at the Word of God. And, because I don't believe God just ever comes to us and says, you just need to accept it. I think God has validated His Word. I think God has proven that His Word is the Word of God. And I'm going to show you that probably over the next two weeks. But if you don't want to hear that, and you don't believe the Word of God is the truth, then don't come. Because absolutely everything I'm going to talk about with abortion and race and gender and homosexuality and any other subject is going to come right out of that Word. It's going to be what does God say about it, not what does Derek say about it. I'm excited. I've never done this before. Uh, these aren't pre-prepared. I've got to go starting tomorrow morning and start putting them together. Um, so if you will, I think it's going to be helpful. It's going to give you, I'm going to give you some scriptures on all of these so that you, you can write these down. And so if your kids come to you and say, why is this wrong? Or why is this right? You'll have specific things to go to. I'm going to answer questions for you that the, the opposition pulls out. For example, they will say, well, Jesus never talked about that. Jesus never talked about that. Well, of course he did. Of course he did. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you where he did those things. So anyway, really excited about it. So um, I'm just trying to jump up some support here. So, All right, let's pray. Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you as we always do for your incredible, mighty, amazing word. I don't know what we would do without it. If we did not have that standard, what would we do? We would be cast adrift. We, we would just, we would have no anchor, but God, you left it with us. You, you took the time to compile it and prove it and validate it. And, and it doesn't matter how much time goes by. I say it all the time. It's just as relevant today as the day that the Apostle Paul and the other uh, messengers put pen to paper. Thank you, God. Thank you for a Holy Spirit that guides us into the truth. And we pray over the next few weeks as, uh, uh, that we'll come with an open heart and an open mind, with, a, with ears to listen, a mind to understand, but most importantly, a heart to obey. And we'll give you glory. We'll give you glory, God, for your word. We'll give you glory for what you've done uh, through our life. We'll give you glory with our testimonies. We will give you glory, God, because that's what we're made for. That's our purpose. That's what we're here for. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Y'all are dismissed. Thank you again for watching our message from River of Life. If this message has touched you today, or if you need someone to pray with, please contact our office at 850-926-1200 or email us at info at rolcrawfordville.com. We also want to encourage you to visit us Sunday mornings at 10.30 or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Please visit us at rolcrawfordville.com for more information and directions.